Good afternoon and welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Jim Fluck. I'm one of the seasonal rangers here and so I have the uh, privilege of giving programs during the summer months and this is our second day program. Uh, so those of you who have driven through the battlefield and started to learn about the second day, you'll note the second day covers a great deal of territory. And since we don't have a helicopter for this tour, we don't have any one point where we can see the whole battlefield. So we'll be talking about just a piece of the second day's action uh, that happens in this vicinity. This is the historic Sherfy Peach Orchard. Uh, the trees that you're looking at, they were not here during the time of the battle. There have been uh, extra generations of peach trees. But these are peach trees and they give us a little bit of a sense of what the soldiers experienced when they were here. As we talk about the fighting that takes place on this ground that we're going to walk across, I'd like to start out by asking a question. How many of you make plans in life? Okay. Do you think maybe you make plans? Okay. <laughs> we all make plans, right? Okay. What happens to our best laid plans? They go awry. They go awry. They don't work. Okay. When this happens in the military, they have a term for this. Does anybody know it? What's that? Charlie Foxtrot. Nope. <laughs> Contingency. No? That's what Close. I'm Snafu. Snafu. Okay, they have an older word though, they would call this the fog of war. We call this real life. Oftentimes we find out that from plan A, we may be to plan B or plan C. How many of you get all the way down to plan Z? Okay. That's life for us. Military calls this the fog of war. We're going to be talking about this fog of war, and I want to introduce you to some mid-level commanders who are here. Have that challenge of figuring out what their supervisors are telling them, their commanding generals, and then making that happen. How do commanders at the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg adjust to this fog of war or this real life? And so I'm going to introduce you to some commanders on each side. Now in order to get us to July 2nd, we need to talk a little bit about July 1st, and I'm going to start out with some compass directions here so we can kind of orient ourselves to the battlefield. All right, start out as you're looking past me or slightly to your left, you're going to identify a tower in the far tree line. The Longstreet Tower is going to mark out the direction of west for us. Okay, everybody turn around. Behind you then is the direction east. And if you look slightly to the right, just above the first set of trees, we can make out a couple of the monuments sitting on the open face of Little Round Top. So we're going to use that and keep that in mind to help us mark out east. Okay, keep turning this time more to your left. As you look now in this direction, you're looking north, the town of Gettysburg. And some of these large red barns are off to our north. If you look across the peach orchard, turning around once more to where you can see some different buildings, part of the Rose Farm. So as we look towards the Rose Farm, we're looking south. The Battle of Gettysburg will start on July 1st out to the northwest of the town of Gettysburg. <coughs> It is going to then spread in an eastern direction. 27,000 Confederate soldiers are on the battlefield, 17,000 Union soldiers. Those Union soldiers will be forced to retreat by late day, and they will take up a position on Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill is going to be the key position throughout the battle. So turn with me here to the north. Okay? As we're looking, we can see some red buildings. To the right of those red buildings, we're going to identify two small white buildings. Can everybody see those? You might need to step to one side or the other of the monument here. Okay, point at those white buildings for me. Take your finger to the top of the trees. Go a little bit to the right. Shake your finger back and forth. You've just sketched out the position of Cemetery Hill. Now, today we see trees. The soldiers, when they were here, said that Cemetery Hill stuck out like a sore thumb. 
How many of you have accidentally hit your thumb with a hammer? Okay, what happens? It goes poof, pops up. Soldiers say that Cemetery Hill is a bald hill, a good open artillery platform. The Union Army has taken that by the end of July 1st. So as we move into July 2nd, the Union Army is working on adding more soldiers to the battlefield so that they can defend Cemetery Hill. Okay, let's turn back out to Cemetery Hill. You might want to step towards me so you're this side of the monument. Union Line is going to extend to Culp's Hill. Okay, so look back towards Cemetery Hill. Begin to look to the right. You're going to see two tall monuments. When we see that second monument, that second monument, if we look really closely, it looks almost like it has a hat and an antenna. That is the Culp's Hill Tower. Looks the same as that Longstreet Tower out to the west. Culp's Hill is a fully wooded hill, so the Union soldiers are there. Now from Culp's Hill, the line is going to make a quarter turn northward to Cemetery Hill. Then it will make a quarter turn southward to Cemetery Ridge. Cemetery Ridge, we're going to mark that out. Remember those two white buildings? Draw an imaginary line from those two white buildings through all the monuments down to the largest monument on the battlefield, the Pennsylvania Monument. Pennsylvania Monument has that big dome on top. Okay, So we have sketched out the position of the Union Army on the morning of July 2nd, and it looks like a U-shape. The Union Army, through the morning of July 2nd, their goal is to add soldiers to the battlefield so they can defend Cemetery Hill. Confederate soldiers are going to begin to plan for an attack. The Confederate line will start on the far side of Culp's Hill. It will ring around the town of Gettysburg and then drop south along Seminary Ridge. Seminary Ridge is that last fully wooded tree line. From us, it's only about 600 yards away. The Longstreet Tower sits right on that tree line on Seminary Ridge. So Confederate soldiers are getting their intelligence reports. They're coming back to General Lee, and so he begins to devise his plan. He's going to attack Cemetery Hill from two different directions. It's like a big pinching movement with the hill in the middle. Or in our military terminology, we're going to call this a pincer. 14,000 Confederate soldiers are to move behind that ridge line out of view. Then they are to turn eastward, coming toward us. They're going to make a second left turn. So I want you to imagine that if this attack goes according to plan, it is almost as if Confederate soldiers are lined up this very road right here, stretching back to the east. They are facing Cemetery Hill. They're going to use Cemetery Ridge as this nice little ramp up to the hill. The left of the line is supposed to be guided by the Emmitsburg Road. Emmitsburg Road is this major road just past the stop sign. We can see where the Emmitsburg Road goes by looking at these series of red barns. So Confederate soldier has his left and he moves northward. This would be an ideal position to stand if you are a member of the Confederate staff or high command to watch that attack. As the attack begins here in this southern end of the battlefield, at the northern end of the battlefield, Confederate artillery will fire as well, and soldiers there will attack from north to south, creating our big pinching movement. These are the first plans. Plan A, if you will. What do we say happens to all of our best plans? They go awry. Awry starts very quickly on the Confederate side. They're going to pause and wait for the remainder of the soldiers who are to make the attack. And in addition to that, there are going to be delays, and so they don't begin moving until about 1 p.m. So the Confederate soldiers move. They accidentally place themselves in view of the Union line. So then they will conduct what is called a countermarch. They'll turn around, 
do it again, find a spot where they can't be seen. So a series of delays, we're all ready to a plan B on the Confederate side. I'm going to pass out a map here for you. Alright, so, a couple things to highlight before I pass around the map. We're going to see the march, the Confederate soldiers, where they have to turn around and take a new route. And I've circled one brigade, this is General Kershaw's brigade, that's the Confederate officer we'll be talking about. And then here on the Union side of the map, I've darkened in, this is General Sickles' morning position. He'll come out here, and I've circled the battery. Bigelow's battery, that's the Union unit that we'll be talking about. So I'll pass around the map here so you can take a good look at it. Confederate soldiers reach the vicinity of where Longstreet's Tower is in the afternoon, 3, 3.30 and they're going to need a plan C because right as they arrive they find that there are Union soldiers here and what they intended to use as their staging ground. So there's been a change in the Union line. After the Confederate commanders made their decisions more Union soldiers reached the battlefield. It's going to be General Sickles third corps. Uh, his men are told to extend the line. Okay, Extend the line, start at the Pennsylvania Monument. We want to draw an imaginary line from the PA Monument toward the Round Top. So that is where these soldiers are placed. Now General Sickles becomes very concerned with his position. He finds some challenges for his men. Well, turn around. What do we see here as we look back to the east? What's the biggest object we notice? Hint, it's green. Trees. Trees! <laughs> Very difficult to fire through trees, right? The first thing that General Sickles is concerned about is fields of fire. He's worried that his enemy can approach him closely before his men are able to respond. So he doesn't have good fields of fire. He feels that this is lower ground. He's worried about the possibility of a turning movement because this is a common Civil War tactic. His cavalry support, there's usually cavalry at each end of the army to help detect what is going on, has been withdrawn. They are being resupplied after fighting July 1st. So he's going to make a controversial decision. That decision is to occupy this ground right here. As we move across the Peach Orchard today, one of the things that we'll be able to note is what General Sickles saw. This is a natural artillery platform, and as we move through, we have a view looking out in any direction. So General Sickles is going to take his soldiers. 5,000 of them will be lined up along the Emmitsburg Road, again following those three red barns. Then he's going to split the left part of the men into pieces. One piece is right here at the Peach Orchard. So we have Union soldiers occupying the Peach Orchard. Now from this fence behind you, up until that first stand of woods, there's going to be open ground, some three to four hundred yards. There's nothing there. On the other side of the woods is a field of wheat. So we have one brigade past the first set of woods that we're looking at in a field of wheat. On the other side of that field of wheat is another tree line. Past that second tree line is the Devil's Den. I want you to think about a large, boulderous grouping of rocks. Another way to locate Devil's Den, look at Little Round Top. Now look at that fully wooded hill just to the right. That is the Big Round Top. So I want you to imagine a valley where those two hills meet. I want you to imagine large, boulderous rocks right in that valley. So this left end of the line is split into three different pieces and it has this shape. The shape is called a right angle or a salient. Does this look like a good or a bad military position? I see your smile. I believe you have an opinion. Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Why? You can be shot at from two sides. Yeah, you can be attacked from two different sides. And in fact, right at that point 
that point can take fire from a range of 270 degrees. What's going to happen to that point when it gets attacked? It's going to cave right in the middle. The salient is a very dangerous position. Late in the afternoon, messages go back and forth between headquarters. General Sickles made this move on his own, and he's going to try to get approval for it afterwards. That approval doesn't come, but late in the afternoon, the commanding general does appear here. A series of words are exchanged. General Meade signals his disgust at this position because part of the army is forward and it is in this dangerous position. Someone who witnesses this exchange writes about it and they give us kind of a description of this mood between the two commanding generals. It's a, kind of a smart aleck type of a thing, the kind of language that if you use with your parents you usually get in trouble, right? <laughs> Not a good idea to use this language with the commanding general either. Supposedly, General Sickles is going to offer to simply move his men back. In a very smart aleck response, the commanding general is going to say that he would order General Sickles to do so, but I fear they will not let you. Points to the west, where he sees Confederate artillery unlimbering and preparing to attack. General Sickles is in a forward position. He is now pinned here. He cannot easily withdraw in the face of the enemy or his men will lose their morale. So now he's in a very dangerous position. The fighting is about to begin. He has two different gaps in the left flank. As the Confederate soldiers come up with an additional plan, they are indeed going to be attacking from west to east and south to north. They are going to hit that point of the salient from both sides with both infantry and artillery fire. General Sickles is in a dire position and he needs his own second plan in order to figure out how to keep this line. Well, if you'll follow me, we are going to move up to the guns and I'll tell you the solution that General Sickles comes up with. What's here in the way of roads? That's, that's a great question to ask. Okay, So the Emmitsburg Road is the major road that is right here. It is a macadam road, so it's an early type of asphalt. There are ditches on either side and fences. Wheatfield Road, right through here, that's a touring road that is put in uh, in preserving the park. So it's not here at the time of the battle. Uh, typically, you'll see uh, roads that were here, and usually when things are added, they're called avenues. Uh, at different points, there are some dirt lanes that existed too. Uh, we'll actually be talking about one of those later. Uh, but in general, you have these 10 major roads coming in. They tended to be uh, paved or they might be toll roads as well. Uh, and so things that have been added in are typically called avenues. It's a great question to ask. Any others? Um, where yeah. were the uh, Sickles troops actually laid out? Now, where were the, if not their trench lines, at least their positions? Right. Okay. So where are they physically standing? Another great question to ask. So, one of the ways you can figure out where soldiers were at is to look at the monuments. And so we have a monument here, Hampton's Battery. There would have been about six guns, and this is the actual position the artillery is in. The infantry is going to be at the far side or the south side of the peach orchard, and so we'll see that in a second when we move there. So that actual point in the line is right here at the peach orchard. The rest of the line extends along the Emmitsburg Road. So as you're visiting a battlefield, you can look for a regimental monument, and then you look for these small blocks. Uh, closest one, if you look back here, see that no parking sign? Look just to the right, you see a small monument. They're typically granite. They say R, L, R, F, or L, F, and that's a flank marker. So if you find the regimental monument, that right flank, that light left flank, you can see physically the amount of space that they occupied on the battlefield. All right, we are right in front of the answer. General Sickles needs something to cover this gap in his line to help hold this position. He is going to call upon the artillery. He has six cannon here. He calls for support and he gets another 28 cannon from this general. Excuse me, this is Colonel Freeman McGilvery. 
McGilvery commands a reserve artillery brigade, so as quickly as he can, he's going to rush an additional 28 cannon into the area. And those cannons stretch down what is today Wheatfield Road in and out of our view. So he's going to use that artillery to try to cover the gap from the peach orchard to the first stand of trees and to be able to hold this position. Well, this is a very tense decision. Colonel Freeman McGilvery, as an artillerist, is going to be very familiar with the cardinal rule of his branch. From his military manual, artillery cannot defend itself when hard-pressed and should always be sustained by infantry. Okay, right here in the Peach Orchard there is infantry. To the east, behind you, remember there's the gap from the fence line, roughly where we see three cars parked, down, excuse me, down to the woods. Artillery is the only thing there. They are unsupported by infantry. A young man in one of these units, a bugler by the name of Charles Reed, notices this situation. He's noticing that it's not usual. His usual orders would be to go to the rear and to assist the medical corps. He's going to write, Captain ordered me to the rear, saying there was no need of my being there. Somehow I couldn't see it. I was bound to see a fight and might be of some use after all. So I disobeyed orders by turning round and going up to the battery again. This bugler Charles Reed, about 19 years of age, this young man identifies what is going on and decides that every single man will be needed. He is going to be correct. The artillery has a lot of challenges. Artillery has a great deal of logistics. First, you need to place the guns in a good location. Well, we're still moving around the orchard here and we can see as we look out in any direction that we have a good view. This is a natural artillery platform. So they've achieved the first part. You need a view. Why? Artillery operates on a principle called line of sight. If you can see it, you can shoot it. You have to be able to see your target. It doesn't matter how close they are. If you can't see them, you can't fire at them. Okay? So we've got infantry support for this part. No infantry support for that part. We've got a good place. Now we add into those logistics. Artillery uses four different types of ammunition. They use a solid shot, which is a pure chunk of metal. It can be cano conoidal, an oversized or giant bullet, or it can be spherical, like a shot put ball. Their second type is a shell. The shell has a small charge inside so that it creates large fragments. The third type is the canister. Excuse me, the, shell, uh, the case shot. Case shot is our third type. A case shot has little bits of metal and powder so that when it explodes it creates this hail. I like to think of it as a hail of death. We have another term for that. How many of you heard of shrapnel? Okay, similar to shrapnel. Have you ever been through a hailstorm? No? What about you? Ever been through a hailstorm? No, sir. Anybody been through a hailstorm? Okay. What happens if you duck in a hailstorm? It'll still hurt. You still get hit, right? Yeah. That's the experience of being under case shot. Even if a soldier does what's natural and they duck, they're still going to get hit because you have to keep moving forward. That fourth type is the canister. Canister is golf ball sized pieces of metal, 36 of them stacked into a tin can. When the gun fires, that casing ruptures and disintegrates, and it turns one of these into a gigantic shotgun. It's pretty deadly. A lot of logistics. Now I think one of the best ways to understand the logistics is to actually fire the gun. I need six volunteers for a cannon crew and if you don't volunteer I am empowered to draft. So who wants to help me out? Alright, one, two, three. You coming? Okay. 
I got four. I got four volunteers. I got five volunteers, and he just got pointed as the draftee. All right. Okay, I'm gonna have you, sir, stand right here. You're gonna be number one. Since you're right there, you're going to be number two. If you'll step back here, you are going to be number three. And if I can have you step back here, you're gonna step right up here. You're gonna be number four. I need you to come right back here. You're going to be number five, and you, sir, are number six. Okay, so you'll notice that the first thing I did is I just renamed everybody. I didn't ask them their names, I just gave them numbers. We're going to use numbers because that helps us remember exactly what our duties are. So we have six men right here at the cannon. Fourteen yards behind us, we're going to have the limber. One chest of ammunition, six horses. Fourteen yards behind that, we're going to have the case on. Second chest of ammunition, chest of spare parts, two more soldiers, six more horses. So for every gun, we got a total of 10, ho 10 soldiers and 12 horses. Which is more important, soldiers or horses? The horses. The horses. We cannot create horses. As long as you can go find volunteers, you can create soldiers. At no time are any of the artillerists allowed to ride the horses. Their job is moving the vehicles. You will all walk. Number five back here is our chief of the peace. She's a sergeant. You're the only officer out of our group here. Puts you in charge. You like that? Okay. How are your math skills? Good. Oh, phew. She has good math skills. Now, when you say that, I assume that you are familiar with some trigonometry? <laughs> sure. sure, excellent. You probably don't know too much about that calculus stuff yet. That's kind of still being developed. It's kind of the newest math right now. Yeah. But you're familiar with trigonometry. So you know angles and arcs, cosine, sine, tangent, arc tangent. Yes. All right, excellent, good. I chose a good battery commander. Now, during the middle of battle, you don't have the ability to pull out charts and graphs. In 1863, soldiers are typically experienced, but we will be talking about one battery that does this for the very first time on a battlefield. All right, so to get us started, I need you to use your best command voice, and I want you to yell load as loud as you can. Okay. Right now. Load. No, 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 no. You can't say it in normal voice. You got to yell it. Load. All right. Now, in the command load, our crew will jump into action. Number three is going to have a small piece of leather on his left thumb, and he's going to place that over the vent. He's going to seal the vent for us. Number one will take a large piece of wood with a sponge on one end. He will dip it in a bucket right down there and then send it down the cannon tube. He is removing all foreign debris, any kind of ash or sparks or powder, maybe from previous firing or anything that just could have gotten in the gun. We're closing that vent in order to be able to pull it out. As this is happening, number six here is our athlete. He is running forward from the limber with great speed. And he hands to number two the shot and powder and heads back for the next round. Number two, step in front of the gun. No, 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 you gotta be physically all the way in front of the gun, your shoulders block the gun. This is the position you don't wish to have because of any <laughs> incoming enemy fire. So as quickly as you can, powder, shot, into the tube. <clears throat> all right, step back out of the way. Number one, you're gonna take that ramrod, you're gonna flip it around and send that shot back to the breech. Very good. Number three, it's going to pull out a giant toothpick-like object, place it down the vent. Very good. Step back. Number four, you're going to take a small tube of metal, place it in the vent, and tie a four-foot piece of string to it. Keep a good hold on the other end of the string. Number three, go ahead and get that in place again. All right. That giant toothpick or prick placed a hole in the powder bag. That small tube of metal, that's our friction primer. 
It has a compound on the inside called fulminated mercury. When that string is pulled, the primer comes out. That causes sparks. Fulminated mercury increases the sparks. They guide down the tube, causing the powder to burn and then to combust. You know, ready. Ready. On the command ready, the crew steps outside the wheelbase. Number four, keep a tight hold on that string. Okay. Place a hand over the ear closest to the gun. Say, ah. Mm -hmm. Open the jaw, everybody. You don't want to trap that pressure inside the head. All right, Sergeant, you're going to have to step to one side of the wheel, too. There you go. All right, now we're waiting for that last command. Yo, fire. Fire! Boom! We get a tremendous amount of noise, a tall column of smoke coming up through the vent, belching forward. This whole vehicle, which weighs about 2,000 pounds, will rock backwards two to three feet. That's our process for firing the cannon. That's what these artillerists are doing as quickly as possible as they have been called upon to come into this line. Now, how quickly do you think they would have to do that? Two to three to four minutes, pick one. Two to four minutes. She's an easy commander to have. She's not very demanding. What's your guess? I'm gonna say less than two minutes. What's less than two minutes? A minute. Wow. You'd be a very easy commander to have. You're not very demanding either. Wow. Three minutes. Huh? Three minutes. Oh, no, we need to go shorter, less time. 30 seconds. Uh, I'd say one and a half, but. Uh... 30 seconds, we're gonna be less than 30 seconds. Really? 15 seconds. 15 seconds, there we go. You are supposed to be able to fire four aimed shots per minute. Rule of thumb, civil artillery is gonna fire once a minute except under two conditions. Counter battery fire, artillery versus artillery, which is what these men come into. Confederate artillery is attacking them from the south as well as from the west. So these men are trying to fire as quickly as they can. Second situation, when infantry is close up to the guns, when you can begin using canister, that means the attacking infantry unit can be firing as well. So you're trying to be as quick as possible. None of these soldiers has a weapon. Well, except the sergeant, she gets to carry a pistol. But it's just a symbol. You have to keep working the gun. It's more effective for you to be able to fire off one more shot than it is for you to join the infantry. So these artillerists have some challenges. They are going to be going through their own plan B, plan C. They've come here to try to help hold the line. We're going to move across the peach orchard here so we can talk about the Confederate infantry attack. But as we do that, I want to organize everybody similar to the infantry. So what I want you to do is I want you to form two lines, shoulder to shoulder, facing me. Yep, right in here, right in here. Very good, very good. All right. Okay, now I need everybody to squeeze toward the center so you are literally shoulder to shoulder. Those of you in the rear rank, I need you to place your elbow at your hip, fingertips forward. Step until you can reach the small of the back of the person in front of you. All right, go ahead and drop your hands. Okay, who thinks they have any personal space left? <laughs> This is how these infantry soldiers are standing. Now, why are they doing this? Let's start with the soldier's perspective. Look to your left, look to your right. How many of you are standing next to a family member? Okay, that is the common experience of the soldier. They are next to family members, friends. Are you gonna be the one soldier that doesn't go forward when everybody else does? No, you're going to go as far as anybody else, right? Why? Because these people are very important to you. I'm going to guess that you two are sisters. Yeah. I don't know of any examples of two sisters standing next to each other, <laughs> but numerous times there are two brothers right next to each other, right? So this is a community that's going forward. They don't want to let each other down because that's somebody very important standing next to you. 
from the officer's perspective, we need tight units for command and control and for firepower. Anybody here a marksman? Neither were Civil War soldiers. They are trained to fire forward. If we could do a freeze frame, we'd see this line of lead moving from one direction to the other. It doesn't matter if you shoot a little bit to the left and you shoot a little bit to the right. We just encourage you to aim low so it doesn't go too high. Okay, now let's see if we can try to move. Our company captain is in the right front. Nice. So I need you to give the command forward march. Everybody is going to begin with their left foot. Then you will use your right foot. Then your left foot again. It's very simple, right? Now, you are supposed to stay shoulder to shoulder, and I am going to stand behind you, and I'm going to be those sergeants and lieutenants who are called file closers. Proceed. Forward march. Uh, close up, close up, close up, shoulder to shoulder, catch step, catch step, left side's moving too quickly, close up, close up, catch step, alright, we can go ahead and pause, it's a bit of a challenge, right? Yes. That's a little bit of what these infantry soldiers are going to experience. We're going to go ahead, we're going to continue through the orchard, each at our own pace, okay? So we've talked about a couple of Union artillery so far. I'm going to transition to the Confederate side and talk about the attacking unit here. The commander is Brigadier General Joseph Brevard Kershaw. Okay. Kershaw's men are going to begin from Seminary Ridge. Again, remember our mark for Seminary Ridge. To the west there is the Longstreet Tower. 2,200 soldiers. These are South Carolinians. It is a brigade that has been together for some time. Kershaw has experience as a brigade commander. Recall from earlier, Confederate soldiers have already been down that path, plan A to plan B to plan C. They had to wait for extra men. They had a delay. They had a challenge while marching. They arrive and there are Union soldiers in their beginning position. They adjust the attack so that it's coming from south to north and west to east. Kershaw is going to be that linchpin. He is told that he has two orders. As his men move from Seminary Ridge, as they come across a third of a mile of open ground, those men are beginning by facing east. They are going to wheel so that they are facing north. They are to attack the Peach Orchard right here. And we can see these monuments and flake markers so we know exactly where the Union soldiers were standing at this end. And at the same time, they must link up with the other part of the attack that was originally moving from south to north. So they have to link up with soldiers on the Confederate side who were near the wheat field. So as we look over this fence line, look into the woods, to your left, there are some woods that are closest to us. So move to the right, there's kind of almost this gap between two wood lines. Back in that direction, that's the wheat field. So that's a pretty sizable amount of distance. So Kershaw is going to have to do some quick thinking on his feet. He's going to be moving from probably about plan D toward plan E. He has to attack the peach orchard. He has to link up over there. As his men are crossing these fields, they are under fire. Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Gaylard, 2nd South Carolina. We were, in 10 minutes or less time, terribly butchered. A body of infantry to our left opened upon us, and as a volley of grape would strike our line, I saw half a dozen at a time knocked up and flung to the ground like trifles. We had half our men killed or wounded. It was the most shocking battle I had ever witnessed. There were familiar forms and faces with parts of their heads shot away, legs shattered, arms torn off, etc. They have moved forward into position to continue the attack. As the Confederate soldiers are nearing the Rose Buildings, 
farmhouse on the left, ruins of the barn toward the right. They see an opportunity. This open ground from the fence line to the trees. Does anybody remember what's there? Uh, infantry that's not Sorry. Uh, no infantry. Right. Cannons just on their own. So no support. So now, Confederate soldiers, orders. Attack the peach orchard. Connect with the attack in the wheat field. Now there's this opportunity. Unguarded artillery. If you're an infantry soldier, artillery is frequently firing at you at any battlefield. You rarely have the opportunity to fire back. All you can do is try to duck. So now that opportunity arises. There are three options. If you were General Joseph Brevard Kershaw, which one would you choose? The area of weakness. Okay, you're going to choose the area of weakness. So you're going to move after that artillery. Would everybody make the same decision? What would you decide? To go for the area of weakness. Okay, so you like going for that area of weakness. Mm -hmm. What do you think? The uh, tip of the triangle there, the, where, where the two top part of Okay, it. so you're thinking about that salient again. So you're interested in following those original orders of attacking the peach orchard itself. Yeah, going for the artillery sounds like a good plan. Go for the artillery. So we have, we have one vote to remember our orders and attack the peach orchard. We have most of our votes to go for that option. And we have no votes for the other part of our orders, which is to connect with the other part of the attack in the wheat field. All right, does anybody know what General Kershaw chooses? Do you want to guess? Um, Partially correct. He's going to choose all three. He is going to make a difficult decision of splitting up his unit. The left side will take upon the duty of attacking the peach orchard and attacking that artillery. The right side will take up the duty of connecting with the other part of the attack. He's going to try to accomplish both objectives in his orders and the opportunity of taking the guns that is in front of him. The men of the 2nd South Carolina are moving from the Rose Farm through these fields off to your left, open fields, they're headed for the Union guns. When suddenly they hear an order, by the right flank, they stop. They are veterans, so they know to turn 90 degrees. They pause and wait. The second part of the order doesn't come. Instead, the Union artillerists, amazed at this stop, fire as quickly as they can. One of the Confederate soldiers will write, we were at once exposed to a terrible fire from the artillery and our men began to fall after the enemy opened upon us with grape and canister and our brave boys were mowed down by the score. We soon reached a piece of woods and there halted for a time, but the work of death and destruction did not cease. You could constantly see men falling on all sides and terrible missiles of death were flying thick and fast everywhere, cutting off trees, plowing up the ground everywhere. But we stood still and did what we could to pick off the enemy's guns. A brigade surgeon that night, Dr. Simon Baruch, would write that almost all the wounds of the men in the second South Carolina were in the left side. Remember as we started out trying to march in formation? We had little gaps develop, people kind of moved off, right? Same thing happened to these soldiers. Two of those units over on the right, instead of moving forward next to each other, overlap. So there's a command that's going to be given to give them to unlap. Well, that command is accidentally transferred further down the line. and the 2nd South Carolina, those men stop. They turn, but they wait for that next piece of the command that never comes. That is when they get hit. I want you to imagine what that would be like. You're moving forward as a unit. You are standing next to people you know. Suddenly you take heavy casualties. That unit could disintegrate. 
It could fall into oblivion and do nothing. Yet its officers are going to step up. Some point in this day, the colonel is going to fall. Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Gaylard, pictured here with two of his children, is going to be in command of the unit at some point in the afternoon. I wish that I could share with you what it is that he says to his men. What words that he comes up with to encourage them to keep going forward. What his plan B is for these men. But I don't know because he does not survive the Civil War. While he does survive the Battle of Gettysburg, he will fall in 1864. But he says something to these men to keep them working as an effective fighting force. They will take to the woods. They'll pause. The rest of the Confederate attack will move out from the west toward the east. By about 6 p.m., Confederate soldiers have overrun the peach orchard. That salient, which is right here, is now falling apart. We can see these two monuments, one on the Emmitsburg Road, one inside the peach orchard. The one to our left would have been facing south. The one to the right would have been facing west. That's the salient. That salient is crumbling. These infantrymen are streaming back toward the east. The artillery will pull out. The Confederate attack rolls through. Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Gaylard summons these men, summons their courage to fight, keeps them pressing forward, and they will join as a Confederate assault sweeps through this area toward Little round top. Gaylord will write, We charged upon the party opposed to us and drove them pell-mell through the woods, shooting them down and taking prisoners at every step. We pursued them to the foot of the stone mountain, the strong point in their position where we attacked them. Here the bullets literally came down upon us as thick as hailstones. It is scarcely necessary to say we fell back. Some of these men participate in a second attempt to move against Little Round Top. Gaylord's second or third or fourth plan encourages his men to move forward. Now, if all these Confederate soldiers are sweeping through this area, what has happened to that Union artillery? Follow me. We're going to complete our trek around the Peach Orchard and we'll take up the story of what happens to those Union artillerists. Do a lot of guys see what was coming and just say, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Great question. How do these men react to what's in front of them? A Confederate soldier on July 3rd says that there, there are different types of people. And he's thinking about this attack on July 3rd and he says, you know, uh, there are those who are never going to get up because they've been hit. There are those who are never going to get up because they're Basically, they're, they're too afraid to go forward. They are, they're thinking about death. Literally, this is the end. It's, it's finite. So don't go forward. Uh, there are those who are almost too eager. They have that bravado. They'll go forward no matter what. And there are those that go forward, not from bravado, but from community around them. And he talks about that there are, there are different types of soldiers. So as a number, I can't tell you how many men make that conclusion that what is in front of them cannot be done and therefore they drop out. I can tell you it's a small number, whatever it is, and you know, trying to move past that feeling, that's why these soldiers are standing shoulder to shoulder with some that they know. As you think about this tough decision, think about yourself. Uh, are you willing to leave your buddy your best friend or your brother behind while you run to the rear? Well, in this case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if I seriously, in a, in a time of battle, never. There you go. That sense of community keeps soldiers moving forward. So, without a doubt, what you identify that some soldiers will look at these battles and say, I can't do this. That happens. And I can't give you a number. Uh, I can tell you, though, most of these soldiers do keep going forward. But that is a part of the psychology of a soldier, looking at what's in front of you 
and figuring out if you can still keep going forward for those who are standing next to you and those orders that are being given. Very good. Yeah, it's a great question to ask. Uh, anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Okay. This area yeah. right here, is this considered part of the wheat field as well? No, we are outside of the wheat field here. So now as we're next to this fence line, what we have here as you look down uh, to my left here, we can see the different battery monuments. Mm -hmm. So this is our line of McGilvery's guns looking at an open field, mm -hmm. with the exception that there are there is an additional orchard in part of that field, which is why you see some small trees in front of you today. The wheat field itself is past this first set of woods. Okay. Now, at the time of the battle, those trees aren't as tall, and in some points the density is light enough to get a glimpse that there is fighting occurring. But there can also be that sense of isolation. So these artillerists have been fighting this afternoon. They are alone. They don't have that infantry support that they are supposed to have by the cardinal rule of the artillery. 6 o'clock to 6.15, that Confederate attack is coming through. That salient is beginning to crumble right at the center. The Union soldiers are moving back towards Cemetery Ridge as quickly as possible. So if you look past me, you can see a barn there. It's having some work right now. That's the Trostle Barn. Just above the roof line and slightly to the left, in the background, there is a monument. The New York Reserve Monument sits on a part of Cemetery Ridge. So as I'm talking about Cemetery Ridge, that's the spot or the line that we're referring to. These Union soldiers are now in full retreat back towards that AM position they were originally assigned to. Colonel Freeman McGilver is going to begin to ride from battery to battery, starting from west, moving to east. He's going to tell them to limber up and pull back. The infantry is falling apart. They need to get out of there as well. He rides battery to battery. He reaches the last one in the line. The 9th Massachusetts Artillery, commanded by Captain Bigelow. Captain Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Artillery are green troops. Now the phrase green means this is the first time they've been in battle. They have been trained, they've trained on a field, they've gone through those commands from the different sergeants so that they can figure out how to fire four aim shots per minute. They figured out how to limber, how to unlimber, but now they're doing it in battle. McGilvery rides down the line. He lets each unit retreat. Now, the Confederate forces are coming close enough. Ninth Massachusetts Artillery that last monument down there where we see the two guns that have kind of that greenish bluish color. They have that color because the original bronze metal has oxidized. There would be six guns there, so that means 60 soldiers, 72 horses. Those men have been in battle for the very first time. Everybody else is falling back, so they are going to fall back as well. But they're going to retreat by prolong slightly different. On our retreat by prolong, we are not going to worry about wheeling the guns back up. Every time the gun recoils, we're using that recoil to get us away from the enemy. As the soldiers reload, the back end of the gun is tipped and it is drug backwards by rope. When it is reloaded, it is set down, it is fired. Recoil gives us three more feet backwards, tipped up, pulled again. Does this sound complicated? It is the most complicated maneuver for the artillerist. Well, these men have done it on a practice field. Now they're doing it under fire from the South Carolinians and the Mississippians rushing toward them. Finally, they get to the vicinity of that barn. They come to a gate and a fence that make a right angle. Through that gate is a little dirt lane leading back towards Cemetery Ridge. About to give the order to lumber up, get the guns off the field. Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery rides up. Captain Bigelow, there is not an infantryman in back of you along the whole line which Sickles moved out. 
You must remain where you are and hold your position at all hazards, if need be, until at least I can find some batteries to put in position to cover you. That third core line that started on Cemetery Ridge moved out. That salient has fallen back. All these men flooding backwards. They're not forming any kind of second defense yet. McGilvery's concerned Confederate soldiers can place themselves right in the center of the line. So he tells Captain Bigelow, hold at all hazards while he tries to get those other guns to form up. Captain Bigelow gives us the plain language interpretation of McGilvery's order when he said, the sacrifice of the command was asked to save the line. Six guns in a quarter circle pointed outward. Ammunition stacked next to the gun so they can reload as quickly as possible. Waiting till they were breast high, my battery was discharged at them, every gun loaded, double canister and solid shot. After which, through the smoke, we caught a glimpse of the enemy, torn and broken, but still advancing. Every time Confederate soldiers get as close as possible, these men fire, they let loose all that metal, reload as quickly as they can. They're buying precious time. Confederate soldiers are trying to pick off the gunners. They're shooting down the horses. 88 horses are going to be killed in the vicinity at the Trussell building, most from this battery. Three out of four officers will be down. Six out of eight sergeants. Nineteen of the men. Captain Bigelow himself is wounded as he is just giving the order telling the men to come off the field. Two guns are limbered up. One hits a rock wall and the horses are so skittish they literally drag the gun through a rock wall. Another one tips blocking the gate. It is righted back on, and they get that gun off the field. The other four guns are temporarily captured by Confederate soldiers. Bugler, Charles Reed, that young man who disobeyed orders by turning around and going up to the battery again, is in perfect position. He has assisted Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery. Now he will assist his captain who has been wounded. Placing a right hand on the shoulder, taking the reins of both horses in his left arm, he's going to turn those horses around. Coolly and calmly he guides them back towards Cemetery Ridge. As he does so, he is under fire from two different directions. Behind him are the Confederate soldiers still pressing their attack. In front of him is the reset of McGilvery's line. Coolly and calmly, he gets his commanding officer back to safety. Confederate soldiers keep pressing up towards that ridge line. They will capture more of McGilvery's guns before finally, at about 8 p.m., at about dusk, Union infantrymen arrive, and for the first time, the entire line has that infantry support. And finally, it holds where it has to hold. Daylight ends. These reinforcements stop the Confederate attack. The Union line now holds, though it had given up this peach orchard. If we think about the events of the fighting of July 2nd, if we think about each of these different officers, they all had to go through different plans. For General Kershaw, it means dividing his soldiers so that he can achieve both of his objectives and the opportunity in front of him. For Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Gaylord, it means summoning the words to keep men moving forward after they experience a great challenge. For Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery, it means bringing a battery of artillery onto the field in the most desperate circumstances where they don't get the infantry support they need and they are supposed to have at all times. 
for Captain John Bigelow. It means telling brand new soldiers to perform the most difficult duty of the artillery on a battlefield, retreat by prolong. And when they are about to leave the field, it means staying there and continuing to fight alone. Each of these officers has to create Plan B, Plan C, Plan D. They have to deal with that fog of war that we often call real life. They have to adjust. What can we say of Bugler Charles Reed? He is not an officer, so he won't be responsible for coming up with alternative plans. But he recognizes this fight and its tenacity. And he volunteers and he stays forward. In addition to that, he helps save the life of this commanding officer. And for that, in 1895, Bugler Charles Reed is awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon.